Hey, everybody, it's the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, and joining me today is Pastor Brad Meyer. How are you doing, Pastor? I'm doing good. How are you doing today? I'm doing awesome. You're, 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 helping, uh, you're helping with philosophy, which is, is one of those things that uh, I need help with because the, the thinking, I, I, I think really, really fast, and then I talk really, really fast, but you end up sort of a lot of times with the cart before the horse and uh, making bad assumptions. Uh, I think there's probably a saying about that, but we're, we're not going to say it because it's a kid's podcast. Uh, <laughs> but... But we're going to start to apply something we learned last time with metaphysics, right? Right. I, well, at least that's the hope. Okay. So um, you said that this is actually useful uh, to point out that there's a God. Well, right. Um, you know, this is, this is the fun thing about, about philosophy is we actually have thousands of years of discussions where people look at things like God and try to say that this is actually a reasonable thing to believe in. You know, because mm-hmm. because the narrative nowadays, especially when you get like the new atheist, you know, the trendy pop uh, atheists, right? Like Dawkins and Harris and these guys. Well, you know, their basic argument that they assume it and then they just yell at you about it. But you're dumb if you believe in God. Therefore, it's dumb to believe in God. That's their argument. And it's very persuasive because they sound very smart and they all have British accents and, you know, they all have PhDs in genetics or whatever. And therefore, they must know stuff about stuff. Right. And uh, I think that they're a little bit simplistic in the way that they talk about it. But this is this is the cultural narrative. And this is what we're up against. You know, this is what my kids, I'm out here in rural North Dakota, right? And my confirmation kids, every year, they have that kid who's an edgy atheist who, you know, maybe watched a YouTube video on Richard uh, Dawkins or whatever. And therefore, now all these kids are dumb and they come and ask me. And so mm-hmm. I think it's important to talk about ways we can show that it's actually reasonable to believe in God. Um, there's You'll run into people, you know, kind of the and other Christian traditions besides Lutheranism, and they'll actually talk about how these things can prove God. And I don't know that I'm comfortable saying that. I don't think God needs to be proved, you know, uh, but I do think it does show that it's reasonable to actually believe in God, that there's something more than just, here's a dusty old book. You know, that, that seems kind of circular. We have this book, we say it comes from God and it shows us that there is a God, therefore God exists. That's kind of circular. It's not very satisfying to people who aren't Christians, but we can actually use our reason to think about, you know, why there should be a God or why it makes more sense for God to be than to have no God. Right. Um, Right. And I I think that's helpful. Absolutely. I I mean, even just sort of starting with the assumption that uh, religious people aren't immediately less intelligent than everyone else, which, which is is sort of the place that we have to argue from every time we step outside with even so much as a cross necklace on. Um, (laughs) And so, uh, yeah, I I mean, that that we can sort of make a defense for our faith. The word for this is is apologetics, Um, but that we can even do this rationally. Um, It won't maybe argue anybody into faith because I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. So how am I going to argue somebody else into it? But I I mean, it, it might be good for for my own self-image when uh, I, I want to uh, at least not worry that that I might just be uh, a, a little bit dumber than everybody else just for believing this stuff. So <laughs> where do I start then? Well, I think you, you've already hit the first place to start from, which is to remember that when you engage with somebody in this kind of discussion, our purpose is not to argue people or beat them over the head to make them be a Christian, because we can't do that. We, we you know, and, and one time here in Bible study, I had a guy Um, We were talking about how you come to faith. And I had this guy, well-meaning, very pious man in the church. And he goes, well, the first thing we have to do, pastor, is convince people that the Bible is the true word of God and that, you know, creation happened in seven days. And I said, okay, um, does that make people believe in Jesus? And he goes, well, no. I said, well, is there anything you can do to make people believe in Jesus? And he goes, and he recited the catechism just like you did. And I said, "So, so maybe our target is off here, right? The point of Christian doctrine is to you know, teach the faithful. Like Jesus says in Matthew 28, we baptize and we teach everything that Jesus has said. Um, it's, it's, you know, Christian doctrine is not for the unbeliever so much as it is for who those who follow Jesus. The point of this is just to show that we're not being ridiculous, right? That there's actually some rationality to it, that it makes sense, that it corresponds to reality. And maybe God will use that to break down some barrier that someone's put up for themselves so that they might hear the word and believe. Maybe not. But at the end of the day, it does show that, you know, we're not just out there, you know, doing some pie in the sky nonsense. Right. Right. So uh, there's a couple of distinctions before we start talking about proofs for God. And, and the, the thinker I wanted to start talking about is a guy named Thomas Aquinas, who was a 13th century Christian theologian. And he is he is like the main guy in the Roman Catholic Church these days. Very smart guy. Very dry guy. Very careful thinker. Um, he wrote a book called the the Summa, the Summa Theologica, which is huge. And I, I want a copy of it, but it's very expensive because church books are always overpriced. But anyways, in that book, he goes through five 
um, five arguments that show that God exists. And before we get into this, we have to be careful with terms. And this is where everyone gets annoyed with philosophy because we start getting into terms and then everyone gets bored. But it's, it's, it's a necessary. So we all know we're on the same page, right? Mm. So the first thing is when we talk about God existing, this is a little bit of a, a misnaming, right? Because in his divine essence, God doesn't exist like we exist, right? I exist because God made me. Well, God's not here in this world that he made the, lay, the way that we are. And so when we say that God exists, it doesn't mean that he exists like I exist. And this is sometimes a, a categorical error that people make, especially some of the new atheists, that you know, God's just a creature in the universe, maybe the biggest and best creature, but he's still in this you know, material world like we are. And well, this is not the assumption that we have, because if such a thing as God is, um, he has to be by definition different than us. And we'll get into that in these, these arguments when we go through them. But that's, that's important thing to remember. It's, it's different from how we want to approach it, especially as, as fallen men who love idols. So every idol that I have is, is sort of from the ground up. It's, I find it in creation. And I say, this has value. I'll love this and trust this and fear this above all things. Right. Uh, we're, when, if we actually are starting from a God who is sort of from the top down, yeah, I would sort of hope that God is different than us and different than this. Well, then, you know, the Bible talks about this. Like, you remember that passage where Moses is hiding in the, or yeah, well, isn't it Moses that's hiding in the cleft in the rock and then God yeah, goes by? God passes by. And, and, you know, all this stuff happens. And well, why does Moses have to hide in the rock? Well, because, you know, God is, is God and he is not. And God is a terrifying thing because he's beyond us in every which way, which is why he has to go along and let only Moses see his backside, right? You know, because mm-hmm. if God shows up and his pure divine essence, you know, and Moses, the sinner stands there. It's not going to work out very well for Moses, you know? Right. Um, and so this is the thing, you know, this is why, uh, you know, we believe in revealed knowledge. This is why the incarnation is so important is because this God who is transcendent beyond all things actually comes here as a man to do something for us. But that's a conversation for a different day. It makes it that much more extreme though, that he was, uh, is just from the, the, the purest essence, different that, that he would become like us. That that's, that's crazy. Um, and it, it, it's, it's important to recognize the magnitude of that, even just because, well, we want God to think like us. We want his thoughts to be like our thoughts, his ways to be like our ways. And Isaiah tells us that's going to go poorly. Um, so right. we have to start here. Right. So, yeah, we have to start with the idea that God and us, we're, we're very different. Right. That's the first thing that we have to do. And the second thing we have to, and this is probably something that will be unfamiliar to a lot of the, the folks that listen to this, unless they happen to have studied philosophy. Um, But there's this idea that we have in classical philosophy called multiple causality. And this is where I'm going to lose people, but it's important distinction because in the modern world, right, I have a thing that happens and it has a reason. And I keep that singular, right? It's a reason. Well, in, in classical philosophy, there's different ways to say things are caused, right? So you can say, why is this caused materially? You know, what's it, what's it made out of? So if I look at a table, well, the material cause is that it's made of wood, right? And then there's the efficient cause, you know, how did it come to be? There's the, the formal cause, why does it exist? And the final cause, what is its purpose? You know, so, well, I need a place to eat my food, therefore I made a table. So my need to have a place to put my dishes on while I eat caused the table, that would be the final cause, right? So there's, there's all these different ways to talk about it. And we'll get into this again a little bit, but I think it's important to remember that when we say something causes something else, or there's a causative connection, it isn't always a one-to-one connection like we often take for granted. And that is a little bit of a finicky thing, but it is important to remember as we go through some of these reasons for the existence of God. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, the last time we were talked about metaphysics, I kept trying to jump way ahead every time because I, I, I want to sort of make all of these assumptions. And well, when you make, again, a bad assumption, there's a saying that we can't say at the kids podcast, uh, <laughs> but uh, that, that we can sort of slow down and, and ask, uh, what is the purpose of this thing? It, it, making sure that we have all of our assumptions right. Uh, it, I, I guess that would definitely help us pin, pinpoint, uh, well, something as important as, is there a God? Right. And, and, you know, when it comes to assumptions, like, I, I guess I'll just to lay my assumptions on the table. I'm going to assume that, that we can actually think reasonably. That's an assumption that I have. And uh, I think that this is what we would call just a self-evident thing, right? That we can think and our thoughts make sense and correspond to reality. There are some people who try to deny this, but they're nuts. And they never act like that's actually true. You know, everyone, always, this is the cool thing to do now in contemporary philosophical discussion is to doubt everything. Nothing is real. There's no such thing as reason. And yet everyone still goes home and stops at the stop sign and, you know, corresponds say, to reality. Talk so, each other says that, that there's, right. there's some sort of connection here. Right, right. And, and you know, that is, it gets ridiculous very quickly and nobody acts like it's true, which is kind of the telling thing for me. But 
anyway, so, you know, we bring these assumptions to the table, uh, I think, which are all pretty reasonable and pretty basic. And I think any thinking person would look at the world and go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. My thoughts do actually have some reality to them, some value. And they actually have a coherence, if I'm thinking rightly, to both reality and just to their internal logic, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're going to bring to the table as we start talking about this stuff. Fair enough. All right. So what's next? Well, there are five things that, that Aquinas argued about. These are the traditional five ways. And he's not the first guy. Aristotle, you know, pagan philosopher, like three, four hundred years before Jesus, he started talking about some of this. But Aquinas is kind of the guy that um, he really makes it sort of Christianized. And, and that's a little bit overstatement because it's not specifically about Jesus. But he also kind of develops them into this. He's the guy that people interact with when they when they talk about him. These have been developed since then. Um, you know, there are more complicated versions of these arguments, but I thought it'd be interesting just to go through kind of the basic ones, because for your average high school kid, this is going to really make them stop and think, you know. So if you are out talking to your friend who doesn't go to church or doesn't believe in God and you go through these, there's enough here that they really would have a lot to stop and ponder over. You know, you don't have to get into the, you know, the Ph.D. level, the like, permutations of this to get something useful out of it. That's good, because I'm not going to make it there, I promise you. I don't think I would make it there either. So, all right. Well, let, let's let's do it then. What's the what's the simple first one then? So the first one is the argument from the first mover, and this is pretty simple. Look around. There's motion in the universe. Stuff happens, right? Planets are orbiting. Things are in motion. Um, why? That's the question. You know, as we talked about last time, why? Well, something had to start this, right? Things have to move for a reason. We know from observation of the universe that there appears to have been a start to it. Everybody agrees about this. Right. Um, we, we know that there was a beginning to this universe. And this logically makes sense, too, because your options are twofold. Either there's a beginning or there's what we call an infinite regression. Stuff just keeps going back forever. And that doesn't make any sense, because if there is no start and stuff goes back forever, then there should be no existence. Nothing should exist. Right. Because mm -hmm. that means there is no start, which is kind of a nonsense thing to hold on to. But it's as an aside, this is one of the things that drives me crazy about uh, a lot of the atheistic people you argue with about the existence of the universe. They appeal to an infinite regression. They'll say, oh, yeah, the universe had a start, but there was another universe before that. And we can't prove that in any way because we can't, by definition, go to that previous universe. But there was. And there's been these series so on and so on forever. Well, OK, that's that's just kicking the can down the road and it's it's unverifiable. So it's really bad thinking. You know, mm -hmm. all we know is this universe and we have to deal with what we see. So this universe exists. There's motion in it. Something had to start it. Something that is not in this of this universe, something that's wholly other than this universe had to begin all the motion of the universe. Aquinas called this the first mover, and he identified that first mover with God. Now, right. you're probably thinking if you're a, a smart person, you're thinking, well, OK, that's great. You just show that there's something that caused motion, started the universe into motion. It doesn't necessarily mean it's, you know. God, right? And this is where these things kind of fall apart because they don't establish the existence of the God or any particular, you know, deity or anything like that. But they do show that there is something wholly different than this universe. And in the Christian tradition, we would say that's God because definitionally, by definition, God is beyond all comprehension in every way. You know, he's eternal. We're finite. We have a beginning and an end. You know, he has, he's almighty, right? We, we don't have all the might, not, not even by a long shot. And right. so, you know, when you look at who God is by definition, well, obviously that who that's who that must be. Right. So just like you told the guy at your church, like this isn't going to show you Jesus, but it might show you that there's something. And uh, you, you mentioned kicking the can down the road, which might actually be a, a really useful tool here. Like what if we stop doing that for just a little bit? All right. So you, you can have as many regressions as you want, but where does it start? Like no more, right. no more, you know, back before behind the curtain, but, but like what's actually at the beginning. Right. Right. And and that's why, you know, this is the problem. If you are a philosophical materialist, I don't mean materialists like the people who buy too much stuff and don't need it, but philosophical materialism where you believe that all there is in this world is the stuff that you can see, the physical things around you. Um, and if you believe that, then you have to appeal to something that's non-material to make the case that the material world exists. And that's either that there was a universe before this one that you can't see or know or understand or interact with, which really does become a non-material thing at that point. Or you have to um, say the universe has always existed, which violates all of the empirical data that we've you know, gathered over the years with looking at background radiation in the universe and whatever. So um, the fact of the matter is, is that logically speaking, there has to be something at the beginning or there should be nothing at all. That's great. 
All right. So that's already plenty to wrinkle my brain. And we, we started here. Let's, let's pick up next time and we'll, we'll maybe hit another question. What do you think? I think we can do that. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us, Pastor. Yep. I was glad to be here.